cure for cancer is perhaps one of the modern, uh, one of modern, modern medicines, are holy grails. But while that cure continues to elude us today, one researcher has potentially taken us a step closer in the right direction. Dr. David Sudransky, profiled by Time magazine in 2001 as one of America's top scientists, has worked on cancer research for a very long time now. And today, his work on tumor graphs has yielded promising results with customized cancer treatment. He joins us now. Good morning, David. Welcome to the show. Good morning. It's great to have you with us. Uh, just to explain to us, or perhaps a definition of tumor graphs, what does that mean? Sure. So tumor graft is really the ability to take a tumor from a patient and put it into or graft it into a mouse. And the whole concept is that you want to create essentially a model of the patient's tumor in a, in a mouse model. Um, you take a piece, put it into the mouse, let it grow, and over a period of time you can then test drugs on the mouse itself with a very high predictive value for what's going to actually happen in the patient with cancer. Mm. This Doesn't is sound like good news for the mouse, but why are, yeah. why are mice used for, for this? So the, the important thing that we've learned over several decades is that when you want to test tumors for sensitivity to figure out which drug will work, that you need a, a living system. You need something that actually mimics the human body and the ability to nourish and feed the tumor. And the mouse essentially, for all, all everything else that it's worth in this case, is really just the incubator for the human tumor. Okay. Mm. Well, this is very um, specialized, personalized care, cancer treatment, um, because these days, cancers, we can't simply say that um, a patient has got lung cancer, but there are several types of lung cancer that you can get, right? So physicians are actually making it more specific, their diagnosis, and therefore needing more specific treatment, which is what you're able to provide. Correct, correct. So what's happened um, over the development of time that we've looked at drugs and cancer treatment, they were really developed originally for populations at large. And you'd say, you know, somebody has lung cancer, let's develop the best drug for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have colon cancer, they said, let's develop the best drug for colon cancer. And it's all about now personalization, trying to figure out which are the smaller groups in that population that will get the best benefit from each drug. So we were using the word personalized cancer treatment, individualized cancer treatment, precision cancer treatment. It all says the same thing, which is how do you break down that population and only give benefit to some of the people in that population and make sure you get the right treatment to the right patient. Mm. To do that, you need to identify the, the exact differences between one tumor and another especially in terms of which drug is going to work mm -hmm. between one patient and another. Now these patients will be very sick by the point that they've, they've come to you, I presume. Has time become an important factor here? Patient selection is extremely important. And um, though we talk about cancer, or think about cancer, and you know, to different people it means different things, the, the reality is that like any other disease, it has its own stages. And sometimes people come in with early cancers, and it's very easy to treat and nothing else is really required other than the basic treatments and sometimes it's aggressive it recurs and it requires very specialized treatment picking the right patient for this approach is extremely important you don't want somebody where you don't have to go through the extra effort and cost because everything's going to be okay but you don't want somebody too sick where they won't have time to be able to benefit from this uh, procedure and actually help them. So it's really choosing the right patient is very important. So what kind of cancer patients would this be suited to? What stages of cancer and what kinds of cancer? The, the procedure is suitable for any type of what we call solid tumor and 95% of all cancers in adults are solid tumors. So that includes all the basic common cancers like lung, colon, breast, etc almost anything except the liquid or the blood tumors like leukemias and lymphomas. Mm -hmm. We've been able to successfully graft all kinds of solid tumors. Okay, so this is an option presented to cancer patients when they're having perhaps a biopsy taken, that would be a good opportunity to also get a sample for this tumor grafting. Is that how it works? How does a patient actually get this done? Sure, so that is one of the most important points. Because it's a live tumor, it has to, and it has to stay alive, it's very important that the, that the biopsy or the surgery be done knowing what's going to happen, that we're going to go ahead and graft. It has to be done within the same day, um, so the cells have to still be alive. And it can be done either during the surgical procedure when the tumor normally is going to be removed, or in cases of metastatic disease, there has to be a biopsy done to remove fresh or living tumor cells. Mm -hmm. That is very important. And for all the listeners out there, it's extremely important to realize that if you're not going to have surgery or a biopsy, this is not a procedure that can be done right now. And it has to be done at the point where fresh or living tumor cells are being removed from the body. 
Okay, now at what point in time uh, you're saying it's it's not a it's not a widely used at the moment this this sort of technology would you describe it as do you see it becoming more and more into the mainstream yes I do like any type of technology you have kind of the early adoption of and during the early adoption you learn a lot of things you learn one is can I do it successfully and how many patients can I get it done and then what are the results those are all important this is a, a marvelous technology if you think about it, it's, it's, some people have called it now almost a mouse avatar. You really create an avatar, just like on a computer screen, you create your own model, essentially, in, in the living, breathing colony of mice. But it's a living model, and because of that, it requires a lot of effort to be able to set it up and get it going. Um, it is one of those things that the more you do it, the more that people get used to doing it, and the more the results come out, the more mainstream it becomes. Mm. We're in the, I think, in the intermediate phase. It's not the early phase where we were just starting to do it. We have a lot of experience, but we're in the test, in the, in the phase now in the United States where we're doing the validation trials to try to, um, to get it out there into the mainstream. And it's still a very exciting time where you're still doing that phase, but it's one more step, I think, before you finally get complete ad adoption. Okay. Well, why this is important is because for the first time, you're bringing it to Asia, and a very um, highly regarded clinic in Singapore uh, is where patients can get this um, procedure done. But are you planning to expand it across the region, or can patients from across the region also have this option? It was very important to us when we developed this technology to get it to as many people as possible. And we have a footprint that now started in the United States, has gone to Europe, uh, including the UK and Israel, and we wanted to be in Asia. We, did, we wanted to make sure that people in this region had access to the technology. And Singapore has just become a really interesting and focal point for us in terms of spreading out through Southeast Asia and potentially other areas in the region. Um, it is, uh, we're working with a fabulous clinic with PCC where you have really skilled physicians and oncologists that understand the technology. So they know which patients are appropriate, and they also know how to use it, which drugs to choose to test in the mice, and be able to move the procedure forward. Can we talk a bit about cost? I mean, people might be watching and thinking this is like a really good opportunity to perhaps cure their okay, cancers or, you know, something they should be aware of. But I'm sure another factor will be, well, how much is this going to set people back, like on top of the already expensive uh, treatments that they will be facing? Sure. So one, one of the challenges that I have when I talk to cancer patients is to get them to understand expectations. And again, cancer can be, but not always, can be a life-threatening disease, when it, when it, especially when it recurs or metastasizes. And the expectations of the patient have to match what are the expectations of whatever we do. In general, I tell patients that cancer treatment is not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, as long as you're still running and you're still there, that's good. This technology is not a cure. Patients that have metastatic or recurrent cancer, unfortunately, at some point, will probably succumb to their disease. Mm -hmm. But it takes, what it does is can expand the time that you can run that marathon mm -hmm. by finding the right treatments, which will um, allow you to live longer during that period of, you know, dur during the successful treatment, and, and add one treatment to another so that you can just be around for a longer period of time. In, in a way, it acts like a bank, um, and you can, it's like an insurance. In a way, you can, if your cancer recurs, then you can go back to this source of information that you have as to what drugs are most appropriate to treat it, right? That is correct. And there's a lot of drugs out there that you can choose from. It allows you to make the best choice and find the ones that will actually work. Okay. We, we'll talk a little bit, I think, about the predictability once you find a drug that doesn't. I just want to get back to your question. Every technology, especially a living technology where you have to pay for the hotel mm -hmm. for the mice and you have to feed them, etc., <laughs> it, it costs money. Yeah. So you're talking about, at least in, in Singapore terms, about several thousand Singapore dollars to be able to do, do the engraftment and do the testing. Okay. Um, and again, every patient with their physician has to make the choice as to whether they're willing to make or can make that extra investment. Um, and how much benefit it's going to bring to them. Okay, and it varies, I'm, I'm sure, from patient to patient, case by case. Yes, it, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, Thanks thank so you so much, much for coming in Great. this morning. A renowned oncologist and research scientist, Dr. David Sadransky, there on the potential of personalized treatment to battle cancer. Dr. Sadransky is in town to present his findings on tumor graphs at the Alley Cancer Seminar, jointly hosted by Singapore's Parkway Cancer Center and Channel News Asia. That's right, that's uh, this coming Sunday here in Singapore. It's time for a short break. World News is next, plus...